All right, so we started recording so that we can have this up on the uh, on the website. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, a particular package uh, called AstroPy and a related package called AstroQuery. Um, AstroPy is actually a really tremendously large um, uh, software package, and it contains all kinds of very useful functions and constants and methods uh, that we use when we do astronomical research. Uh, some of it's quantitative using physical quantities, some of it's uh, working with images and spectra. So we're probably going to see different aspects of the AstroPy package later on, but today I wanted to focus on two of these uh, components. One that uh, goes into how we use units, and so those of you who are physicists in the group know that every quantity has to have a unit. That's very important. Um, and it turns out AstroPy has some uh, specific ways in which it works with units uh, that, that make it actually very powerful, particularly when we're converting between different quantities. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, coordinates, and then um, uh, uh, Roman's going to lead a presentation using the AstroQuery uh, so service, um, and that's actually a really powerful one that we definitely will be using because that allows us access to all of the various catalogs of information that's out there uh, for our sources, uh, right from our computers, so that's very useful. <clears throat> so I'm going to just go ahead and put the links for all of the things we'll be talking about today in the chat window. Uh, so you'll have links for the slides, uh, the AstroPy Unis tutorial, the coordinates, and the uh, AstroQuery tutorial. And like yesterday, um, we'll get to the tutorial parts, which uh, Christian and Roman are going to lead today. Um, you want to bring up those uh, tutorials, which are all these the, the, the Python notebook files. You can open them up in the Google Colab environment. They should work totally fine with Google Colab. Um, and then just as Christian and Roman uh, kind of walk through these things, just kind of follow along to make sure that you're understanding each of the steps. And of course, those notebooks will be available for you to play around with a little bit more afterwards. There's a few exercises interspersed in there as well for you to, to think a little bit more. Um, before I start up any questions, I'm going to do a quick presentation, but any questions before we, we begin? Uh, not for now, Adam. OK. <laughs> there may be later, but yes, not for now. Yes, that's for sure. OK. All right, so let me just start by talking a little bit about um, uh, these uh, AstroPy ideas of units and coordinates. Uh, so units are just like the units that we use in physics and biology and chemistry class all the time. Uh, now, often when we're programming, we don't usually think in terms of units. We just think of numbers. So if you have something in code like this where you say, you know, the speed is 100, well, you have to know what those units are. And, you know, as many of you know, we have different units for speeds. Um, you know, if you're in, in, in Europe, you'd use kilometers per second. If you're in the US, you'd use miles per hour. If you're talking about snails, you might use centimeters per second. So there's different ways of using these quantities. Um, and if you just give a number, it's not necessarily clear uh, between uh, folks uh, what's the right unit. And there are very famous disasters that have emerged when people don't get their units right. Uh, one of the Mars landers crashed into the surface of Mars because someone forgot to convert English units into to CGS units or, or, or sorry, SI units. Um, there was an airplane that almost crashed in my hometown of Buffalo because they put in 500 uh, liters as opposed to 500 gallons of gasoline, which is different. So there's lots of these kind of things that happen when we don't actually explicitly use our units. And so again, in coding, we just put a number or we might say a comment or maybe we'd label our quantity to indicate what the units are, but this is not quite, doesn't scale well and it can make things kind of awkward. So <clears throat> AstroPy actually has a specific set of uh, operations that uh, attach units to quantities and also allow you to convert between these quantities. So, um, so the first thing is uh, we have these things called unit objects and just kind of uh, recall from what we talked about Python on Tuesday, objects are you know, sort of computational things that can have different different properties. They can include the value of a quantity, but they can also include functions that work with that quantity. So that's why we kind of generally call these objects. Um, and so they can they're contained in this package ashapi.units, and you're going to get a chance to kind of see this this code in action. So don't worry about it too much. Um, but they all have just names that are associated with with the unit you expect. So u.meter is a meter. Uh, u.m because m is a common shorthand for meter is also a meter. Uh, same thing with kilometer and km. Um, and what you do is you literally attach these to numbers by just multiplying. So a quantity like 15 meters can be specified as the number 15 times the unit. Um, you can also attach those units to arrays of numbers. 
So if I have a whole bunch of measurements and they're all the same units, say meters or kilometers in this case, then we can just multiply that array by that quantity and all of those uh, quantities uh, now have a unit. Um, and then there's also a, a notation here called two. And again, we'll see this when we see the notebook that allows you to convert between units. And those of us who have had to spend a lot of time in class, either as students or as teachers, going through unit conversions and you know messing them up in some way, this is fantastic, right? Because you can just let uh, you know let Astropy figure out your unit conversion for you, and it will change the number to correspond to the correct unit. Um, now, uh, there's also physical types associated with these units. So it's Astropy has enough sort of recognition to know that a meter is a length and a second is a time, and energy is a composite of these different things. And so it will know how to transform between different kinds of quantities. You can't just convert a meter into a second, for example. It will, it will tell you that that's not something you can do. So it has the awareness of what the sort of physical nature of these quantities are. And then there's also another package within here that contains important physical constants. So instead of having to look up these constants, if we want to say, convert, um, I don't know, a, a light year into a, a, a mile or something like that, or we don't quite remember what the, you know, the constant for G is, uh, those constants are also contained in this package as well. Um, and so, and then you can combine these with the united quantity. So in this case, for example, uh, it's computing the uh, Schwarzschild radius for one solar mass star. And it just brings in the constants G and C, this is the definition, 2GM over C squared. And then you can convert that into a unit, which is in this case, the earth radius, right? That's a unit. And so it gives you this short field uh, constant in units of earth radii, and even tells you that that's the units of that number. So again, this is a nice, easy way to kind of slide between you know, equations that have many different quantities and different units that we might use in astronomy or uh, in regular physical science. Um, and then also is able to do conversions in some cases that are not the same units when it's very clear how those conversions happen. And a good example is when we go from wavelength to frequency. Wavelength and frequency are not the same kind of unit, but of course we know that they're related through the speed of light for, you know, for light in a, in a vacuum. And so there are ways that you can convert between angstrom and in this case, terahertz, uh, by just specifying that you're doing it as a, as a spectral conversion, as a radi radiation conversion. And it will properly convert this you know, wavelength into its equivalent frequency. So again, there's lots of different ways that we can do conversions. And we're only going to touch the surface of this today in the demonstration. Um, but just keep in mind that there are these, these uh, many different ways of doing this. Right, so that one would fail. <clears throat> okay, so the other topic we're gonna talk about today is coordinates in time. And we've already mentioned in the first on Monday how important coordinates are uh, when we're, we're analyzing spectral sources. And again, AstroPi has its own specific coordinates package and a particular object called sky chord. So again, think of this as an object or really what it is is a class. Remember those classes in Python are things that contain values and functions that can work on those values and all sorts of different things. And so you can create a coordinate uh, using various notations. In this case, you're specifying the RA and DEC using the decimal quantities, right? And getting those units in degrees, right? So that's one way you can specify RA and DEC. You can also specify it in terms of hours for RA. Um, there's different ways of doing this. And the great thing is that the coordinates package is able to recognize and convert between all these different kinds of coordinates and convert between different coordinate systems. So again, when we talk about right ascension and declination, those are equatorial coordinates. But if I wanted the galactic coordinates, that's something you can easily pull up by just converting to galactic. Um, and we'll see how to do that in the tutorial. Okay. Uh, and then the last topic is, and I think this is touched on a little bit in the coordinates tutorial, uh, I would say this is relatively important, but not as important for a lot of the work you're doing is if you're dealing with time, um, astronomers have different ways of measuring time. We obviously use things like seconds and minutes and hours as we're tracking, you know, observations that are happening. Um, but we also use other formats of time, including something called the Julian day, uh, which is kind of a, if you think about it, it's kind of a weird uh, idea. It's the number of days past a, a certain point in the past. And I actually don't remember what that date is in the past, but it's a really long date in the past. 
Um, and it's a way of sort of measuring time sequentially in units of days from that point. So again, normal, like the, the Python built-in time um, formats don't include things like Julian day or modified Julian day, um, and also aren't really good with very precise timing. So if you're doing, for example, something like tracking the pulsations from a pulsar, uh, and pulse, pulsars have kind of millisecond uh, oscillations in their, in their radio light, um, you need something that's a lot more accurate than something that can be done with the usual Python code. So Astrify also has a time package, and it has, again, these, this, is a, this is a class, and so it has a value, it has, you can assign it different properties, uh, it has built-in functions, for example, converting this time into a Julian date or into a format that includes the year, month, day, hour, minute, second, all right? So lots of different ways of representing these time variables, and these are all sort of built into the system. We can figure out what time it is right now uh, in, in UT time, if you really wanna know that. All right, so we'll have more examples of that in the tutorial. Um, okay, and then the other thing, just keep in mind for both time and coordinates, these objects work on both individual numbers. So if I just want one time, they just put in a number in there and it works on arrays of numbers. So I can have a time object that contains many times or a coordinate object contains many coordinates. Um, and these packages are able to work with both of those. So you wanna kind of, anytime you're working with these quantities, you wanna make sure you kind of print out what is the variable I'm looking at so you get an idea of, am I using just a single number or is this kind of an array of numbers that's contained in here? Okay, so that's just a general uh, overview. Um, anybody have any questions so far about what we're gonna be doing today? And I, one thing I didn't show on the slides here is that the other thing we're gonna be looking at is Astro Query, as I mentioned, is searching through catalogs of, of seller information. And we'll see how that, that gets worked out in just a little bit. So any questions before we, we dive into our uh, tutorials? Okay, I don't see any quite yet. Uh, so, um, so I think uh, Christian, you're gonna start us off on the units tutorial. Do you wanna share your screen? Right, uh, let me share my screen. So let's start with the unit tutorial. Um, if I, I'll just jump in to say, I've put the link for that tutorial in the chat window in case it got dropped earlier. So people that want to access uh, this link, uh, I think this is the right link. Is that right, Adam? The thing that I have right now, that's the right. Um, so if you click yeah. on that link, you should be getting this, this notebook here. And then you can start working on it. Uh, and if you want to save it, you can copy and save it in your so file. Uh, should be a make a copy or edit. Well, there's a save a copy to your drive. Save, yeah. So yeah. save a copy in drive, then you can uh, you can give the notebook. So so starting with the units. Um, so AstroPy, as Adam was saying, AstroPy used uh, units are found in this module called AstroPy. That units you usually just name it as you. Uh, this is good, but I will caution uh, sometimes against this. If you have a variable in your code named you, and you are importing AstroPy that units as you, uh, there could be some conflicts there. But in general, this tends to, to be a good idea. So if you just run this cell, nothing is gonna happen. You're just importing this AstroPy unit. So as Adam said, units are, uh, uh, Units are, are objects, Python objects, so they have properties. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, u.m here will give us meter. And if you want to understand exactly what this is, uh, you can do the, uh, underscore uh, dog. So this is another hidden property of this unit. It would just, it's just a string that someone, when they were writing this code, um, put there to document what this unit is. So if you do u.m that doc, it will tell you that this is the uh, the base units for length in uh, SI units. You can also do something else. Uh, uh, this is you can do u.parsec that day. So this is the parsec, which is a 
typical unit we use for distances of stars. And they will tell you in the documentation that this is uh, approximately 3.26 light, light years. Um, also, you can, uh, if you do that physical type, it will tell you what the, uh, if this is the length or uh, a time. Uh, so let's do, I guess I've run this before, so it's kind of, but we can try something else. Let's say u that parsec, um, that physical time, so physical type, not time. This should also tell you what kind of unit this is. So a parsec is a unit of length, such so in the meter is a unit of length. And in a second is the unit of time. And then there is, it, it's, uh, these units also have al aliases, meaning that they didn't code them with just one word. So in this case, meter, u dot meter. So a meter is coded as M. Uh, so we have a question. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. Yes, yes, this is Adriana. So um, to, to run this, this code, I copy. I copy from the um, link that you send us and mm -hmm. start a new a new a new one for our own computer. That's my question. Uh, so oh, sorry. Yes, the point is that I I link on the I click on the link and mm -hmm. I try to run it and they, they say that I have errors. So uh, I guess I am in the Adam's computer. Say something like that. What kind of errors do you get? This should be running in your own Google Drive. So um, it's really not connected to Adam's computer at all. So if you do a copy, if you do file okay. that save as a copy in Drive. All right. And then let's see if you do that, what happens? Yeah, let me see. And then let's just run the first, the first, the first set. So Adrian, do you want to share your screen really quickly so we can you see? Can, yeah. You don't even actually need to save this. You should be able to run it through Google Colab without saving it. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you may not be opening it up through Google Colab. Yeah. Oh, the point is that I am two, two computers. One is in the call <laughs> and I am the Zoom with another one. So I can share it at this moment. <laughs> but um, uh, okay. I. So, sorry, I don't want to be late the, the tutorial, so I I keep working in my own and I'm, I, I'm going to resolve because I think I understand what I'm doing. Board. Okay, yeah, if you want to just follow on Adriana, then um, you, can, you can play with this a little bit later when we figure it out, but Dina will have office hours today at six if you're still having trouble opening it. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, hopefully that problem that you can fix that, um, but otherwise you can just follow along. Um, and just a quick thing, maybe there's a way I can reset. Uh, yeah, already, if you go under yeah. edit, go under edit and click on clear all outlets, tablets, there you go. So everything now will be a surprise. Okay, because <laughs> I, I was running this before, so it's kind of, okay, so. So if we do, we were, we were sorry, we're up here. We're not there yet. We we're at the uh, aliases. So units have been, uh, have aliases. So meaning that they coded them, they coded the meter as something else as uh, the actual word meter. So if you do that aliases, you can get, see all the, uh, all the aliases of meter. Uh, we can do the same thing for, so you meter and you dot M are the same thing at the same unit. Uh, this is also true, I think, for uh, parsec. Let's see, u dot parsec dot aliases. So this will give you all, all the aliases of parsec. It's only one of them. Again, it returns a list. And then u dot parsec is the same thing as u dot pc. So this is just, um, I think they did this to, to keep, um, to make it easier. 
for you to interpret in another person's code. Uh, arc second also has aliases. So there is arc sec and arc second. They're both valid. You can use uh, you can use either arc sec or arc second. And um, so what you that arc second returns, it returns the symbol for arc second, which is this is actually a string. So let's see if we do type. Oh, this is actually a core unit, uh, which is an object, but it's it, uh, it's signature. Basically, if you do, uh, what's the word? You that arc second. Um, uh, oh, where did the analysis? So let's just okay. So arc second usually in astronomy is uh, we usually represent it by these two dots. I was trying to show show uh, where this is coded in the code, but that's probably not important right now. So, um, so we went over two things first that you can use. Uh, you can check what kind of type they are, so the physical type. And you can also check all the aliases, so all the uh, basically renaming of these units. And as you know, we have uh, CGS and SI systems. Uh, Americans like to use uh, none of these, uh, um, but um, all these are available in AstroPy. So if you do U that inch, which is an American unit. Is that it's called an imperial unit, not an American unit. If you use u that inch, that's not available in AstroPy. But if you do u that imperial, sorry, let me repeat, repeat that. It is available in AstroPy, but you have to call it through u that imperial, and then that will give you all the imperial units. Uh, another example of a, you, you, an imperial unit will be. Um, can someone give me an example of an imperial unit? Uh, feet. Feet. That's that's an that's also available in AstroPy. Sorry, imperial. I guess it's not available. Food. Food. I think it's a yeah. Foot, foot. not feet. Feet. That's the plural. And if we do, I think if we do physical type of this, just like we just did. I'm just repeating that. Um. Check the syntax again. You that imperial for that physical type. This should tell us that this is also a length unit. Give me a second. I'm just going to copy that. Maybe it should have been easier to type it. But there you go. So this is also a length unit. And if you want to look at all the all the complete list of all the units in Astrify, you can just follow this link here. Uh, you have that in your notebook. OK, so the next thing is composite units. So composite units are these units you make by multiplying or dividing or raising to the power units. So you can think of, uh, for example, velocity, which is you know kilometer per second. That's a composite unit. Uh, so you that kilometers over this is just a regular division. So they have defined a division uh, function for these objects, and you can divide them. So you get a kilometer per second, which is a unit for, for velocity. You can also do miles per hour. Um, so you that imperial at mile, and then you can even we're doing an imperial unit and we're dividing by a regular SI unit, and it still works. Uh, this is, uh, we can do energy, uh, which is EV, and then we can do distance over time. And then we can do, this is the volume units, cubic centimeters. Uh, so this is now we're raising to the power. That still works. So you, you don't just divide, you can raise a unit to some power and they still work. And this is, this you probably see a lot of these in AstroPy. In, if you're going to deal with spectra, um, uh, to use this composite units in, in, in AstroPy. So this is, this is all good. It, it, uh, it has all these uh, 
built in in SFI to uh, combine units in all kinds of ways. So the units are actually, if you do type unit, you will see that to check what a unit is something is, you do type u dot m, it will tell you that this is a, uh, a reducible unit, which is some kind of units. Um, so now we're gonna go to the quantity object. So the quantity object is something that has a unit. And remember quantity, as Adam was saying, has a unit and the, and the value. So for instance, that those are the physical quantities we use in astronomy. So for instance, 3.7 AU here, to initialize that you have 3.7, which is the number, and then the unit, you do times, so, oh, sorry. And this will give you a quantity object. So if you do type, if you do type 3.7 times u dot au, this is no longer a unit, this is a, uh, a quantity, which is different from this irreducible unit. Uh, any questions so far? Oh, okay. I think it's well, pretty clear I, for me at least. Yes, okay. sorry, Christian, I still have the question. Mm -hmm. Now I can share my computer, uh, my, my window. So I, I mean, still doesn't, um, can, I still doesn't, <laughs> I can still work running the, 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 the code because I did, don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Would you mind, uh, uh, I think maybe in the Slack, you can talk to uh, one of us. I think Roman will probably be able to help you if you just send him uh, a quick uh, message. I think you, he might be able to, to help you with the troubleshooting. And then we can just uh, go from there. Yeah. Does yes. that make sense? Well, I can, well, if you don't mind, I can share. Well, Adriana, actually, if you maybe if you could take a screenshot of what you're seeing on your screen and then put it in Slack, then Roman can handle it while we're while we're moving on. Yeah, you, if you use Slack, if you put that in the Slack, maybe. Uh, you can. Yes, yes, I, I, I can do that. Okay, cool. So I was checking the chat. Uh, yeah. So there's. Uh, Adriana, you should be able to run edits. Uh, this is. Um... I, I think we're good on the chat. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, All right. Okay. I don't know. Yes. Thank you. Would you would, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm on Slack. I'm available to, to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. So, so far we've done units and we've done quantities. Uh, and another way to initialize quantities is to uh, not just to uh, times units, so value times unit, you can also just call the quantity class itself. So this is how we call class u that quantity, and then you pass the value and then you pass the unit. So this will be u that quantity, it will give you the same thing. So if we wanna do, for example, if you want to do 10 parsec, you can do u dot quantity uh, 10 and then you, unit is u dot parsec or u dot pc. And this should be able to give you 10 parsec, which is a, an, again, another quantity object. So quantities have units and have, they have values. And this is important because you can, uh, there are, um, they're compatible with NumPy, which is a standard uh, Python library that has been uh, built and it runs very fast. Uh, so if you just import NumPy and you do, in this case, we're initializing a uh, quantity, which is gonna be an array of numbers. So here we have 1.2, 6.8, 3.7 7 parsec per year. And this is still a quantity, so if you do, type x, this should be a quantity, not an umpire array. 
And these are compatible and they work together. So you can do all kinds of, all the physical um, manipulations you do with arrays. You can do this with, with, with quantities that have units. This is good because you wanna keep track of units when you do your calculations. So quantity have attributes because they're functions. Again, an attribute, you remember just like you've seen today or not, and yesterday, um, objects have attributes. So if you do Q that value, um, for example, so we're gonna initialize a new quantity called Q, which is in mega parsec. This big M here stands for mega. Uh, also you can do kilo, you just use KPC. So if we, were to, if we do Q, um, v, let's call that V, tens times you that kiloparsec. So this will be kiloparsec. Um, if you do key that Q dot value, that would give you five, right? That's the value of this Q, so it's five megaparsec. And then the unit will be megaparsec. You can see where this is going, right? We, we want to convert from, maybe if you wanna to convert to units from megaparsec to kiloparsec. And then you can still do this with arrays as well. And so if you have this array of velocities, um, you can do that value to get the value and then you can do that unit to know what unit they are. So compatible units uh, can be used now in automatic operations. So you can take something that's in parsec and multiply by something that's in kiloparsec because this is, um, oh, sorry, you can convert parsec to kiloparsecs. So you can take a quantity, for instance, here we have uh, three kilometers and you can multiply by two and that will give you six kilometers. And it's written really well here. Um, so this is just the string that returns. And if you do, divided by two, that would give you 1.55 kilometers. Uh, if, you, if you raise it to the power of two, you get a uh, kilometer square, which is, not, which is now uh, a different unit. So if you do um, Q square, I'll just want to copy this and then paste. The internet is a bit slow. I'm just copying and pasting this. It's probably much easier to type than copy and paste because of my mouse. But anyway, if you do, uh, oops, sorry. If you do type, it's still, it's still gonna be a quantity, but if you do this, that um, unit, you should get that it's kilometer square, not kilometer, because you squared it. Any questions so far? So this is all neat, and then you can start doing combined quantities. So example, we have this quantity one, which is meter per second, which is a velocity. And we have another quantity here, which is centimeter per uh, second uh, per gram. And then you can combine these two quantities together. Let's see, I didn't run this. And you get something like, what would be the units of this Q1 times Q2? Any guesses what the units of meter per second if you multiply by the centimeter per second per gram square, what do you get? Let's see. Okay, if no one is uh, doing the guesses. You get something that's in centimeters times meter times over gram square per second square. Um, if we divide them, you get something that's, let's see, grams, so the, the, since we have per second here and per second, the per second will cancel. And then meter uh, and centimeter will still be there. Um, maybe this is, comes later on, but we can, uh, we can also, I will show you how to convert units. So we, we, can, we can convert this thing in 
in uh, meters and then divide them by this one that's in meters that we cancel. So they only cancel if they're exactly the same unit. Um, so if we raise that square, you get meter square per second square, which makes sense. And this is also works element wise. So if you have an array, instead of just setting each one of this, you can think of if you have an array of 10 million elements, you don't want to multiply each element by the unit. You can do that and it still works, but you can just multiply the array per unit uh, with the units. What I mean is you can do an array of 1.2 times u parsec over u year and then 6.8 times u parsec over that year. You're allowed to do that, but this is, this is exhausting. So the best way to do it is just to take, uh, is just to take this, this array and then multiply by the unit. And it does it automatically. You can add two quantities, which makes sense. Uh, so if you add meter to meter, you get eight meters. You can also, uh, add things that are identical. So if you add kilometers and centimeters, that will work out. Sorry, meters, um, kilometers and centimeters, that will work out. But you can add, let's say, kilometers and kilometer per second, because those are not the same system. This is a length, this is a velocity. They should not be added together. So if you run this, you get an error. Okay, did everyone get an error here? This is expected because, uh, you can add the kilometers in the kilometer per second. Okay. So this is neat. Uh, this helps you manipulate all kinds of units. So the last thing I think, maybe not the last thing, but we should also talk about converting units, which is crucial. Let me check the chat. Um, Adam is heading out. Uh, uh. So okay. the, a question in the chat is whether things get converted to kilometers when you add kilometers and centimeters. Right. Um, this in here we got things that are converted to kilometers. Uh, I think that's maybe they converted to the bigger units. Uh, I'm not quite sure. So we can try something like meter and kilometers and see if that's true. Like according to the chat, it's the first unit uh thanks carlos oh the first thank you carlos okay yeah, so either you... way i don't think you should be relying on this behavior uh, if you need a specific unit you should explicitly convert into that unit and not expect python to give you the right unit because it might change in the future versions and the like yeah yeah that's very important yeah i think what roman said is just it, that's what you should probably be doing yeah you're right carlos if you at centimeters and kilometers, you get something that's in centimeters, the first unit. Okay. Right, this is the importance. As Roman says, you probably should probably convert all your units in one system. So for instance, um, here we have two years and we can convert years to seconds. Does anyone know how many years are in a second or how many seconds are in a year on the top of your head? We can check. So 2.5 seconds will give us, sorry, uh, 2.5 years will give us this many, um, so seven, let's see, 78 million. Um, I think there was, maybe someone said how many seconds there were in the chat. Mm -hmm. All right. They, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's in the day. So if you multiply that by the number of days in a year, so the, we don't know how many days they, they assume to be in a year, and you can check that. You can say one year times you, year, and then to convert, you have to do this uh, two. So notice that I'm putting parentheses here to you that second, and that should tell us, oh, sorry, I meant by how many days. That seem to be, I think it's day, maybe day, not days. No, maybe it's day. Okay, they assume 365.25 days. 
which is not quite, you know, I think they're not, uh, they, maybe I've heard of APS, not APS. Anyway, so this is something to keep in mind when you convert um, years and, and days and seconds. And then we can also convert angles. So for instance, here we have uh, a square degree. We can convert it to stair radian. So this is the units of uh, a solid angle. If you've never heard of stair radian, that's what this SR is. So it's, it's just a, um, a, like a degree square already, but in radian. Um, and then you can also convert uh, imperial units to regular units. So this is important. Uh, I think this is good. Um, maybe um, since we have 15 minutes, uh, I'm gonna let you run through the rest of the notebook yourself and then say something about uh, coordinates um, because we only have 15 minutes and I think it's important probably to talk about coordinates. Does that sound good? Before I go to coordinates, do people have questions? Does everyone understand how they're gonna convert their units? Uh, I think this is, this is gonna be, the more you practice, I think probably the better. So let's go to the coordinate notebook, which is, um, I think, is that in the chat as well? Uh, uh, it is, but would you mind posting it in the chat again? Right, so this is, I think, share. Should I do a, sh I think, share. My internet is very slow here. Give me a second. Or maybe I can just post this link here that, that I have. I don't need to do share. So that's the link. Oh, sorry. Um, everyone in the meeting. Okay, so that's the link to the to the coordinate, which is um, another Python object, AstroPy uh, object. So coordinates are important uh, because. Um, we work in reference frames, uh, as you know. So for this, we're going to need um, to, to, to just run this installation. It's already installed for me. Uh, this is Astro Query, so it queries a bunch of catalogs, which is what Roman is gonna talk about later. And this is just another uh, package for displaying URL, uh, sorry, uh, websites for querying websites, so requests. Um, and then our regular matplotlib, and then the object that we're gonna need from uh, AstroPy is gonna be called a uh, sky chord, which is the main object that initializes coordinates. Um, so let me go edit again and clear all outputs. So if you run this, this all this, this installation cells, it should be fine. Um, and then, so, Let's start with, with, uh, with time since we, um, so time is another, another um, again, it's another object in AstroPy. And uh, you know, as we in AstroPy we work in UTC time or we can work also work in local time. And this, this is from a workshop that, that was in 2019 and you can um, call this time uh, class and give it a string that's the day. So today is 2020, sorry, 2021. And it's, today's June, so it's gonna be six and then 22, 24. And since I'm in New York, this is gonna be, uh, sorry, is it 14? Maybe fourteen forty six. So this is uh, this it, gives it, you a time. It's actually one forty five in California, right? <laughs> oh, okay. So one forty five. Let's go with California time. 
Uh, sorry, well, right. 14, right? Not 1 a.m. This is this has to be 24 hours standard. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this is the units here is uh, 1 a.m. So if you want to do 1 p.m., it's uh, what is it? 13. 1346. Um, and then you can check out. Uh, how we convert in, in, in different times. Uh, so times have different conventions. So we have this called uh, Julian date, as Anna mentioned. We have MJD um, and all these other conventions. All these are conventions of how we keep track of time, especially in astronomy. Let's say star was observed in, they're gonna tell you this star was observed uh, in MJD, this date. So you're gonna need to convert that to uh, something that makes sense to you. So, if you take this time that we have right now and you convert it to a uh, Julian date, you will get this string here. No string, sorry, this float. And that will tell you what the time is in Julian date. That's the, anyone remember when the Julian date starts? Uh, I don't think I know, um, but you can Google that later. Um, and then since this is a, uh, um, something that's um, an astropack quantity. It's also manipulable. So you can, you can add uh, this time here to a NumPy array. Let's say uh, times a unit. So this is a quantity. So if we do that, this time object now has, uh, it's in UTC, in UTC and it starts, it gives you all the time. So if, what we're doing here, we're just adding six hours. Uh, this workshop is not going to be six hours, but what this is is just uh, one, two, three uh, hours, and you can add that to um, uh, to this time, and it will give you uh, an array of times. Uh, so let's get really quickly to coordinates because um, this is important. You're going to see this over and over. So coordinates. Uh, for that, we use this uh, other class called SkyCord. Um, and how you do that is you give it the right ascension, which I hope Adam talked about a little bit in the astronomy workshop, and you give the declination and you give it the frame. So ICRS is the um, something like the equatorial system. So we're gonna initialize this object and this will you print out. So this is uh, nine degrees array and 0.6. Uh, degrees deck. You can also this in. You can also do this in radians. Uh, you can also this in hour angle. Um, so if you want to do this in in hour angle, so here we have sky coordinates here is uh, zero hour thirty nine minutes, and the declination is zero degree fifty three minutes, and this is in the equat equatorial frame, and this will give you exactly the same thing. So you can either pass it as a string formatted like this or as a as a float. Um, and then you can also do another, this is just another convention. So they give you multiple options of initializing the same object uh, because some people are more comfortable with one or the other. So you can do this entire string in one in one string, um, separating by uh, colons. Any questions on that? So this is useful because uh, using this core sky chord, we can actually query areas in the sky. So for instance, this, this, this example here is we're gonna query this, uh, this object, HCG7, uh, and I don't remember exactly what this object is, but any object that's in, in this catalog, you can, uh, you can do sky chord from name and just query this object. Roma, do you know what this object is? S HCG7. Um, no, but we can look it up. We can look it up. Or you can do your favorite object. Um, uh, it says that it's a group of galaxies. Okay, so it's a group <laughs> of galaxies. That's in this catalog. And if you just do from name, uh, that will give you the center of it. And then to get the the array, you can just do this object that array that this object that deck. And these are, they're gonna be again, astropy connects uh, angles, which is another uh, 
way of representing angles. Um, in the array, we have units, so we have units. So in this case, it's uh, if you do that value, it will just give you the value. And if you do that unit, it gives you the unit. It's in degree, but that's what this small zero means. All right. You can also convert this, so you can do two u dot radiant, and that will convert it to radiant if you. So this would be zero point zero fifteen radiant. Um, and then I think I wanted to sh since we only have I think we still have some time. Okay, so. In the last 10 minutes, let's see if we can actually see some images. So you can actually query some objects in uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a survey that uh, took a lot of really nice images of galaxies. Um, so to do that, so I'm gonna work through this example. So this is not something uh, to do with AstroPy. We're just uh, using this request uh, to get the URL, the, the link to this image that we want to get. So this is just querying that page. And we're writing that into uh, a file that we're going to call uh, hcg7 scara. So this is, so what basically this is, is going to this website and it's, uh, and it's giving, um, uh, it's requesting this website from SCSS that has the image of this object that we want. Um, so to do that, we just use the cells here. And to actually show what this image is, we can just display that image in your, in, your, in your notebook and it looks very nice. So this is the group of galaxy, the group of galaxies. Um, there's lots of galaxy in these images. Uh, with different orientations, which is pretty cool. Uh, so this is all done uh, using, again, AstroPy in this request module. Uh, so this is important because uh, maybe for those of you that are probably gonna need to query some um, area in the sky, or they're gonna ask you to query this object, this could be one way to do it. But uh, uh, Roman is gonna talk a little bit about Astro Query, and that's gonna give you a better uh, way of querying uh, objects uh, in different catalogs. And there's gonna be an exercise here that you can um, try your other favorite object and see if you can actually get an image of it in SDSS. The, I think this is the most crucial part of actually catalogs is how to actually uh, match and compare catalogs, which is mostly what uh, Astro Query is about. And that's what Roman is gonna talk about. So this was just a brief introduction to, again, to a bunch of, to a lot of things. So we introduced units, we introduced uh, uh, quantities, we introduced uh, coordinates, and we introduced uh, time. In all of these uh, object, different objects in Astro, AstroPy, you can think of it as um, some basket of objects and they all interact with each other and they're very useful to do a lot of computations that we do uh, in, astro, in observational astronomy. Um, and also something that maybe is in this notebook is how to convert be between frames, which is probably more important than, because uh, uh, then I, Roman is gonna talk a little bit about, um, uh, about Astro Query. So I'm just gonna spend the next five minutes talking about uh, frames. So this is our, uh, remember our, HGC center was a coordinate that was in the equatorial frame. So the equatorial frame is based on, on, on our sky, so positions in our own sky. But the galactic coordinate system is based on the galaxy, so the center of the galaxy. And this is quite different. Does anyone know like how far we are from the center of the galaxy? In miles, kilometers, parsecs? We are, uh, I think we are at least 10,000, at least we are almost uh, 10,000 um, parsec away from the galactic center. So this is what this, uh, 
So this is, uh, but here we're talking about angles. So that's it, only in angles. Latitude, which is uh, Adam talked about, hopefully in the astropy, in the astronomy, uh, introduction to astronomy uh, workshop. So you can do conversion between sky coordinates. So this says the frame here is ICRS. You can convert that to galactic by just doing that galactic. Um, and then another way of doing that is just to do transform two. So the difference between this and this is that this will just return uh, the galactic coordinate. However, if you do transform, this was actually this will actually work on the on the on the object itself and change it. So now the object I think is galact. Oh, it's still ICRS. I guess not. Um, okay, so I think maybe it doesn't transform it exactly, but I think this is another way of. Uh, so if we were to change this to HC, sorry, HCG galactic, this will now be a transformed uh, coordinate in galactic coordinates. So sometimes you wanna use equatorial coordinates, sometimes you wanna use galactic coordinates because uh, if you're studying stars in a galaxy, right, that's, that's probably a better way of you of, uh, of referring to to these stars. Uh, let me check the time again. Okay, we're almost out of time. Uh, so the point of these notebooks is not to get through all of them. It's just to get you to introduce you to the concepts, and then to you have time on your own during the next six weeks to explore. Uh, you can always learn something new um, from these notebooks, and uh, I think. Uh, but we want you just to, to give you the basics to get started. Um, so again, we went over units, time, coordinates, um, and quantities. And all those are in this AstroPy infrastructure and they help you uh, do, so this will they help you do all this kind of computation very quickly without thinking about it. Any questions before I hand up to Roman to talk about AstroPy? Well, I, I have a question, Christian. Yeah. But it's a very silly question. And I will ask you, maybe Carlos can help me. Uh, well, I'm still, <laughs> I understand your instruction and already did it for the um, astrophysics um, units. Yeah. But for open the, um, astrophysics coordinator in my own computer mm -hmm. is, is it's a opening so maybe in uh, by the other side carlos maybe you can help me um Brigitte, i think uh, put a simple instruction to open the the code in the computer so uh Sorry, how about we take a maybe five minute break until yes. let's say 1407 Pacific time, so seven minute break. Uh, yes, I'm going to I'm going to pause the recording and we are recording and I'll share my screen now. Uh, let's see. Okay. So in the next 15 minutes and probably less than that, I will talk about a sister module to AstroPy called AstroQuery, which allows you to query astronomical catalogs. So before we do anything else, let's just uh, look at the problem at hand. So we'll try and solve a specific problem as an example. So this is what we call an open cluster. And this is just a picture from Wikipedia. This open cluster is called NGC 188. And there's just a whole bunch of stars all clustered together, hence the name, on the sky. And we believe that all of those stars form from the same cloud of gas and dust. And this is why they're all so close together. And what I would like to do is I would like to get the magnitudes of all the stars in this cluster 
And specifically, I would like to get both optical and infrared magnitudes. And I would like to plot a color magnitude diagram of this cluster, which is what we would use to analyze a group of stars. That is something that can tell you the age of the cluster, the composition of the cluster, and all the other properties that you might want to know. Uh, so uh, in a second, I'll talk about how you can get the code yourself. But let's just have a look at the final result before we do anything else. So oh, in the we're app, seeing your Google Drive. Sorry. That, um, are you showing like an, an, an image? We're seeing only your Google Drive. I am sharing my browser. Can you see the picture? No, we're seeing your Google Drive. Maybe you click, if you click on the tab. Oh, OK. Uh, let's try that again. Can you see the notebook right now? Yeah, now we are. Did you, did you see this? N now we're seeing no. it. No. Oh, OK, sorry. I was talking about that. Not sure what happened there. Yeah, so this is the, the picture from Wikipedia that I was talking about. So this is just a bunch of stars. Uh, that are really close together. And I would like to get the magnitudes of those stars and plot out uh, the color magnitude diagram. So in the end, I would like to get something like this. So on the y-axis here is the G magnitude, which is an optical magnitude. So that's roughly corresponding to green light. And on the x-axis is a difference of magnitude. So this is what we call a color in astronomy. And this is a difference between a G magnitude, which is optical, uh, and a J magnitude, which is infrared. That's something like 1.2 microns. Uh, and from the shape of this diagram, from the shape of this curve, you can work out the parameters of the cluster, which is what we ultimately want to do. And to be able to do this, we are going to use Astro Query. So we are going to find catalogs that contain magnitudes of all of those stars. And it's going to be two separate catalogs. There's going to be one catalog for optical data and one catalog for infrared data. We're going to cross match those catalogs so that we have both optical and infrared data at the same time. And then we're going to plot it. Just going to check the chat. Oh, OK. So that's just uh, people not being able to see my screen. OK, yeah, sorry about that. No idea what happened there. OK, uh, so the, the notebook that we will be working with is available on the GitHub account that we created on the GitHub repository that we created for this uh for this tutorial so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to post a link to this github in the chat so that you guys could all open it and what you want to do is you want to go into this notebook here called astro query tutorial and in order to be able to edit this we are going to need to open it in google colab and i also have it open in my browser so in order to do that, you need to click on GitHub here. And presumably, you can just copy and paste this link. So let me try that. Uh, and it might be able to load it in. OK. Yeah, so please do that. And I'm going to pause for maybe 30 seconds to make sure that we're all on the same page and we all have this notebook open and editable. And if you can't do it, just let us know in the chat or unmute yourself. Can you show the steps real quick again? Yes, so uh, the link that I posted in the chat is the link to GitHub, which is this page here. And this is the notebook that we want. It's called Astro Query underscore tutorial dot IPYNB. You can open it then you can copy the link and you can just paste it um, in your uh, cola. All right, so what I did there, sorry, Google cola, is I just went to the GitHub tab here and I pasted the link here and I hit the search button and that just opened the notebook. Okay, are we all able to do that? Chat. Yeah, when when you search it, um, how did you open it? Uh, so there's that search button, and in my case, it just yeah. opened automatically. Oh, you see, it didn't for me. It didn't open automatically when I clicked the search button. Uh, okay, so did anything at all show up when I searched for it? Sorry? Did anything show up when you searched for it? Yeah, it's a... a it shows different things, like one coordinates intro, four coordinates, like, it shows the the subtopics. Uh, Astro query tutorial there. 
Mm, yeah. Or even the GitHub. R oh, Roman, I think the link in the GitHub is the, the link one? of the, sorry, I think the link in the chat is the link to the entire GitHub. Um, yes, so if you type that link in, then it's going to show all of the files on the GitHub and you need to open Astro Query tutorial. I'm concerned that you may not be on the GitHub tab when you're searching. Okay. It worked for you, oh, one. Okay, so is there anyone left for whom it didn't work? Okay, can you do it one more time? <laughs> okay. So I just open Google Colab, right? Which I usually do just by Googling it. Right, and then you need to go to the GitHub tab out here. Right, so this allows you to load files from GitHub. Mm -hmm. And then I have the GitHub file, the GitHub notebook opened in a separate tab, just called Astro Query Tutorial. And you can just take the link, right? So I'm just copying the link to this page. And then you can paste it in here and you can hit the search button and it's going to open the notebook. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is the link that you are pasting. Thank you so much, Carlos, the, the other Carlos. <laughs> All right. Uh, so once again, our okay, aim is to, hmm? sorry, what was that? No, no. Uh, no oh, okay. So our aim is to get a color magnitude diagram. So the first thing that we need to do is actually install Astro Query. It is not installed by default. Uh, it is one of the optional packages. And if you are running the notebook locally, you can just type this command out here, uh, pip install Astro Query. And if you are in Google Colab, then you can run this command by adding this exclamation mark in the beginning. So let's just run this cell right away. Uh, run anyway. And hopefully what it's going to do is install Astro Query for us. And it might take it a couple of seconds to do that. And after that, we'll have Astro Query available. OK. Uh, so it says that it has successfully installed all of those packages, including Astro Query. And now we can actually use it. So we can import it right here, and the cell will be able to run without producing any errors. So I'm going to step through everything uh, one line at a time in order for you guys to have a clear idea of exactly what's happening here. So the first thing that we need is we need the coordinates of the cluster itself, right? So we want to load all the stars from that cluster. So we need to know where the cluster is in the sky. And out here, I opened a Simbad page of this cluster. We looked at Simbad in our astronomy tutorial, and it gives us all the parameters of this cluster. So before we go any further, let's just have another look at the picture of this cluster. Uh, can somebody tell me how you go about identifying whether a star is a member or not of this cluster. So say I have this star here. How do I know if it belongs to this cluster or it just happens to be in the same part of the sky? Do we have any ideas? You can just unmute yourself if you like. All right, so you just have an arbitrary star. How would you go about checking if it's a member of this cluster, if it actually formed from the same cloud of gas and dust, or it's just a random star that just happens to be in the same part of the sky? I guess Maybe you need to find its age. Uh, so that would be difficult to do, right? Ages are hard to measure, especially for individual stars. Uh, but there are a few like HR diagram, maybe. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, but in order to plot a HR diagram, we need to know which stars to plot, right? <laughs> Age distance to Earth. Uh, yes. So this is a very good point. All right. So we're going to impose three requirements. First of all, we're going to impose a requirement of it just being close to the center, right? So this star here is unlikely to be a member because it's too far away. And then we are going to look at the distance. So the cluster is, on average, uh, about two kiloparsecs away from this. And if a star is way closer than that or way further out, then most likely it does not belong to this cluster. And finally, uh, what is an ML algorithm? <laughs> I'm actually not sure. I'm just reading the chat. Uh, and finally, we can check the velocities of those stars. So if we have a star 
that's going in this direction. Let me see if I can draw it. Uh, can I change the color? Uh, I don't actually. Uh, color, color, color. Okay, there we go. So we have a star and it's going that way. And most of the cluster is going this way. Then most likely that star does not belong to the cluster and it just happens to be there randomly. Right, so this is exactly what we are going to do. And the first thing that we are doing in this notebook is we're just giving Python the average coordinates of the cluster. And in order to do that, we are creating a new sky chord object the way Christian showed this. And this sky chord object is created with a whole bunch of attributes. So we're going to need the right ascension. And the right ascension, we can just take it from Simbat. In this case, it's 12. 0.11 degrees. So that's exactly what I'm doing, 12.11 and the units, the same way we saw in the previous part of this workshop. And then we do the declination, 85.26, 85.26. So it's right here. Then we're going to need the distance to this cluster, as was correctly suggested by one of you. I think it was Carlos, not sure. And we don't actually have a distance, right? So if you look at what Simbad gives us, there is no distance here. But what we do get is parallax. So that is how much this cluster wobbles in the sky as the Earth goes around the sun. And astro pi can calculate the distance for us. So we can take this parallax, which is this value here. Right? So I just lifted it from here. It's in milliard seconds. And we can create an angle object out of it because the parallax is going to be an angle. And then this distance object is what can convert a parallax into a distance. So in fact, if I print what we're getting as a result of this, it's going to tell us that the distance to this cluster is approximately two kiloparsecs. Right? So something like uh, 1,980 parsecs. And then once we have the distance, it is now saved in this variable here, we can just plug it into this distance attribute. And finally, we need the proper motions. So how fast this object is moving. And both are given in Simbad. So there's the proper motion along the array axis and the proper motion along the DAC axis. They're both given in milli arc seconds per year. And so I'm just importing them here. And by the way, we're doing this by hand, as you might have noticed. And there is a way of doing this automatically. There is a way of querying Simbad. And I linked a different tutorial that talks through how you go about doing that. And I'm just skipping that here for the uh, interest of time. OK, so now we have this sky cohort object called NGC 188 Center 3D, and it contains all of the average parameters of the cluster. And now we can go in and we can look up all the stars that exist in that cluster. So we're going to need two different catalogs. We're going to need an infrared and an optical catalog. And there is this website provided by Strasbourg uh, Data Center for Astronomy called Vizier. We can just Google it, and it's usually the first link that shows up. You don't have to open it. Uh, I'm just showing it here for completeness. And this is a website that allows access to a lot of different astronomical catalogs. And you can just search for catalogs here. So specifically, I'm going to use what we call a Gaia database for the optical data. And there's a whole bunch of matches that show up. I'm specifically going to use Gaia EDR3 catalog. So that's going to give us exact positions of stars, exact proper motions, exact parallaxes, and optical photometry, so the optical magnitudes. Uh, and you might notice that all catalogs have identifiers, and the identifier of the Gaia catalog is I350. And for infrared data, I'm going to use a two mass catalog which stands for a two micron all sky survey. And it's going to be this catalog here and it's called uh, II slash 246. So let's start with Gaia, let's start with the optical catalog. Uh, and what I'm doing here is I'm importing this object called Vizier which allows us to query Vizier, the website that I just showed you. And we're starting with Gaia. So we're going to query this catalog I slash 350. This is just the identifier of Gaia EDR3 that contains optical data. And then I am changing the row limit to minus one. So minus one means load all the stars, right? Otherwise, there's going to be a limit to the number of stars that are being loaded. And by setting it to minus one, I am asking uh, Astro Query to load all of them. And then I'm running the query. So this is this line of code here. And I am telling Python to query the location of this cluster that we created before. This is our sky chord object. 
and I want this query to run within 0.5 degrees on the sky. So it's going to take the coordinates of this cluster uh, out here. It's going to draw a circle that is uh, approximately half a degree across. And it's going to load all of the stars that exist in this circle. So this is all the code up to here. And in fact, what I would like to do now is I would like to just comment all of this out uh, and only run this bit of code to see what we're getting. So let's just see what the result of this query is going to be. It might take it a few seconds because it would need to access Vizier and download a large amount of data. But in the end, we're getting a table. So this is the Gaia EDR3 table, and it gives us the right ascensions of all these stars, declinations of all the stars. It gives us parallaxes, proper motions, and uh, magnitudes as well. So this is the GMAC that I want to use in the end in my plot. And right now, we have 10,400 or so stars. Most of those are not going to be members of the cluster. We just loaded all the stars that exist in that region of the sky. And now we need to do the filtering by proper motion, by uh, distance, and all the other things that we just discussed. And this is, in fact, what this commented out part of code is doing. I'm going to uncomment it, and let's have a look at what's happening next. So the next thing that I'm doing is I'm removing all the stars that are fainter than G magnitude 19. So remember that the larger your magnitude is, the fainter you are. So what I'm telling Python here is that I don't want this entire table. I only want a slice of that table where the G magnitude is less than 19. And the reason why we're doing it is because stars that are fainter than this magnitude are just so exceedingly faint that there will almost certainly not be uh, not be useful for our purposes. And then I am also removing all the stars whose parallaxes are way too small. So if your parallax is smaller than 0.25 milliard seconds, and I'm just removing them because most likely those parallaxes would not be reliable, and it doesn't matter as the parallax of our cluster is significantly larger than that. And so those stars are not members of the cluster anyway. And so I'm running those two filters. And now if I comment all of this bit out and just see what is left after those two filters. So let's print the guy table again. Instead of 10,000 or so stars, we should get a much smaller number. So now we're getting only 4,000 stars. But still, a lot of those stars are not going to be members of the cluster. So let's keep on going. Let's remove that and uncomment the last bit of code. So this part of code is creating a sky code object for all of these stars that we just loaded. So it's very similar to what was happening here, except instead of just typing in the average parameters of the cluster, we are using the results that we just obtained from Vizier. So we are going to need this uh, array ICRS column, which is right here. This is going to be the right ascensions of those stars. Uh, the DE ICRS is going to be the declination, which is right here. And then we're also loading the parallaxes, and they're coming from the parallax column of the table, which is out here. And notice that we are doing the conversion into distance again, the same way we did it before out here. And then finally, we are getting the proper motion in array, which is this column here, the proper motion in DAC. Uh, and lastly, we also need to specify the epoch when those coordinates apply, because stars are moving. And in Gaia EDR3, that epoch is actually 2016. So this is the last thing that I'm specifying. I'm creating a time object, the way Christian showed this from the epoch of J2016, that's Julian 2016. And that would be the time of observation. Do we have any questions until now? Because I know this is a lot of information, but we're just creating a sky coordinate object for all the stars within half a degree field of view around the cluster that satisfy those two criteria. Just going to check the chat quickly. OK, so now that we have the sky coordinate object defined, we can play with the coordinates of those stars. And the first thing that we are doing is we're using this method that is given to us by AstroPy called separation 3D, which allows us to calculate 3D distances between objects. So in this case, we are calculating the 3D distances between all the stars that we just queried and the center of the cluster which is this object here. And we want to make sure that those distances are small, right? because if you are too far from the center of the cluster in 3D space, then you are not a member of the cluster. And then we're calculating the differences 
between the proper motion of all of those stars and the average proper motion of the cluster. And we are in fact using Pythagoras theorem. And right? so this is the root. And then we are doing the difference of right ascension proper motion squared plus the difference in declination proper motion squared. And right? so this is just going to be an array of differences in proper motion, in speed of motion between all of those stars and the center of the cluster. And then we are imposing a condition that we want the 3D separation that we calculated here to be less than 50 parsecs. And we want the difference in proper motion to be less than 1.5 uh, milliard seconds per year. And we're only selecting stars that satisfy those two conditions simultaneously. And finally, we're just printing the number of stars that we extracted. So let's run this cell in full, and we're going to see how many cluster members we got. So only 244. So we started with 10,000. We filtered out uh, 6,000 of those by using those two conditions here. And then we ran this algorithm to check for cluster membership by proper motions and distances. And we're only left with about 250 stars. All right, so those would be all the stars that actually belong to this cluster. OK, I have any questions about this? OK, fantastic. So this was the okay chat question. How do we determine the distance to save a star? Right. Uh, so uh, we loaded the average distance to the cluster, which is out here, right? And we got it from the parallax that we got from Sinbad, and then we queried the Gaia catalog to get distances or rather parallaxes to all of the stars, and we converted them to distances too. Uh, and then we use this function here to calculate the difference in their positions in parsecs. Oh, sorry, are you asking why we're choosing this number specifically? Is that the question? Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't understand this right away. Yes, this is an arbitrary number. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can uh, vaguely look at the dimension of this cluster and you can sort of guess if. Uh, that number is appropriate or not. So this number was actually given in the AstroPy tutorial that I derived this tutorial from. I am wondering if Simbad gives us the physical extent of this. Uh, Wikipedia would, in the very least. Uh, does it? It does not. Okay, never mind. Yeah, this is an arbitrary number. You can, in fact, play with that number. So if you choose that number to be too large, then you're going to see the outliers in the uh, cover magnitude diagram in the end. And then you can keep reducing it until it looks clean. OK, uh, so we've loaded all the optical data. So now we're going to query the two mass catalog, which is that identifier here, II246, in order to get all the infrared data. And you might notice that this query is slightly different to the, to the equivalent line that we used in the optical case. So in the optical case, we only specified the identifier of the catalog. And here we're using this extra uh, attribute here, extra argument. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to load an extra column. Not all of the columns that are available are loaded by default. The default set is represented with an asterisk. And uh, those are the columns that are going to be loaded by default, but there might be extra columns that are not loaded by default. And what I am saying here is load all the default columns as well as this extra column called date. And that column in the two mass catalog stores the date of observation. And this is going to be important because stars are moving. And when we are comparing their positions, we want to make sure that we are converting them to the same epoch. And by default, date of observation is not loaded, but I'm forcing uh, to load that date here. And then once again, we are setting the row limit to be minus one, which means load everything. And then we are doing the exact same query within half a degree around the center. Uh, and uh, this is the sky chord object of the center of the cluster. And we are saving the result in this variable called t mass underscore table, and we can print its length out. And it's going to be fairly long. It's going to be 5,000 stars because we haven't filtered this by cluster membership. And we are not going to. Uh, we only need to do this with one of the data sets because we're going to cross match those two data sets in a second. And all of the non members in the second table are not going to find matches. So they're going to fall out on their own. So we don't need to do the uh, membership 
identification twice. So we're just going to leave it at 5,000 members. And now we are going to cross match those two catalogs together. And Astro Query provides all the tools that you need in order to be able to do that. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to figure out what this date of observation is that we just loaded. And this is happening in this cell. And I would like to take it one step at a time. So I'm going to add a new code cell. So this is all the data that we loaded, all the infrared data from the two mask catalog. And it has quite a bunch of columns. And all of those are default. And this is the extra date column that we loaded in. So we can print all the dates of observation specifically if I just uh, explicitly ask Python for that column. And you might notice that all of them seem to be the same date. And so this was an all sky survey and it was just scanning the sky. And it looks like it imaged all of the stars in this cluster on the same date, which happened almost 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Uh, but we don't know for sure, like there could be some other date in this ellipsis and we're missing it. Uh, which is why we are using this function in NumPy called NPUnique, and that's going to remove all the duplicates, and we can see whether it is true that all of those dates are the same or not. So if I uh, wrap this in NumPy unique, then it's going to show us all the unique dates, and it looks like this is indeed the case. Right? There's only one date that is unique across that entire uh, across that entire table, and. Lastly, I am creating an AstroPy time object by just taking this unique date and wrapping it in the uh, time constructor, which gives us the time object, and I'm saving it in the variable called tmass epoch. So let's print that variable. Let's delete this uh, cell that I created that we don't really need. And let us print out the tmass epoch to see what's in there. And hopefully it's just going to be this 1999-1019 chat. Can we access the two mass catalog to see all the non-default columns? Yes. Uh, so the way I would do it is just by looking that catalog up on Vizier, and that's going to give you the list of all the columns. And you can see that the ones that are default are highlighted with uh, checkboxes. And the ones that are non-default are not, so date is not highlighted, so it's not a default column. So I personally like to scout the table that I am working with via the web interface. There is also a way of doing it in code, but I don't find it terribly convenient. So I like to scout the table with uh, my browser before loading it so that I know the names of all the columns, as well as which ones are default and which ones are not, as well as the descriptions. Right? It explains what those columns are. OK. Uh, just trying to close the chat window. <laughs> okay, so now we have this variable called uh, tmass epoch that stores the date of observation. And so, as I mentioned before, we want to be comparing things in the same epoch. And we can do that with the tools that AstroPy provides us. We can take all the Gaia coordinates that, and I remind you guys, were all by default in J2016. And we can advance those coordinates, or in this case, retard those coordinates into the past to the date when the two mass observations were taken so that uh, they have the same date. So to do that, we are first of all creating a sky chord object for all of the two mass stars. And previously, we created sky chord objects with all of those extra parameters, not just right ascension and declination, but also distance, proper motions, and the like. This is because we were doing membership checks. But we're not going to do this with a two mass catalog, as I mentioned during the cross match that's going to take that's going to be taken care of automatically. So in order to create this sky chord object, we can just go on the minimum basic parameters of right ascension and declination. We're not going to need anything else. So let's run this cell, and we're going to get all the uh, sky chord objects for all the two mass stars. And then this function given to us by AstroPy called apply space motion is what can take coordinates on any given date and translate them onto some other date. And in this case, we're taking the Gaia coordinates that we loaded all the way here into the variable called NGC 188 coords. And we are applying space motion to the epoch of the two mass catalog. And we're saving the result in this new variable called MGC188 coords underscore 1999. 
and it's going to do this in a couple of seconds. And now all those coordinates here, they're all taken in the same epoch as the guy coordinates. So we can now compare them uh, directly against one another. And now it's time for us to run the cross match. Right, so in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to go over all of the two mass stars and we need to find a match for all of the Gaia stars and figure out what the uh, numerical index of that match is. And this is taken care of by this one function that's just called match to catalog sky. And what it's doing is it's taking all these sky code objects here and it finds matches for those objects in this other catalog of sky code objects here and it returns the indices here. So in fact, let's run this cell and let's have a look at the output. All right, so that finished running. And now let's just check all of those three output values one at a time. So ID X Gaia is going to store the indices of all the matches. So that means that the first star in our Gaia catalog matches to 1,244th star in the two mass catalog. The second one matches to the 35th star in the two mass catalog and the like. And this is why we didn't really care about membership identification for the two mass catalog, because all the two mass stars that aren't members simply aren't going to be selected here. And then the 2D separations are how far away those matches are. And they should be fairly small if those matches are successful. Uh, OK, this is a lot of uh, gibberish output. Let's just get specifically right ascensions uh, in degrees. Sorry, not right ascensions, in degrees. Let's convert it to a specific unit. OK, so this is the distance between uh, the Gaia stars and the corresponding two mass matches in degrees. And those are very small numbers. In fact, it's probably more uh, more illustrative to look at it as arc seconds rather than degrees, because those are very small quantities. And as you can see, most of those distances are way less than one arc second. So this is good. That means that the matching stars are close, so there is a good chance that those are indeed the same stars. And then this third variable is giving you 3D distances, but it's completely useless to us in this case, because remember that we created the two mass sky code object uh, with no 3D information. So it's just going to contain some arbitrary numbers. <laughs> so we're not even going to look at that uh, because it's, it's just wrong information anyway. OK, so now we have our matching IDs. And in fact, a good thing to do is not just to look at the distances as numbers, but to plot a histogram to see how far away those matches are. And this is exactly what's happening here. So I'm importing matplotlib the way we did in the previous workshops. And I am plotting the distances between the matches in arc seconds, which is what we were looking at a second ago, uh, except in order to make things clearer, I'm taking the log base 10 logarithm of those. And then this is the final result. And so in this case, zero corresponds to the difference of one arc second. This is a logarithmic scale. This is 10 arc seconds. This is 0.1, and this is 0.01. And the predominating majority are very, very close. So the chances are that this guy is an outlier and not actually a cluster member. And I'm not too concerned about that because it's quite far away. But in general, just to answer the previous question of how we determine the distance of 50 parsecs, you can literally look at this histogram. And if it looks neat and centered to range of small number, then you probably chose it correctly. And if you see lots of outliers, then the chances are that you need to adjust your selection settings. So in this case, everything is OK. There is uh, a couple of, I guess, suspected outliers, but they don't seem to be important because they are a tiny minority. And lastly, I want to get the J and G magnitude. So J is in infrared, and G is in the optical. And the J magnitudes I am getting from the J Mac column of my two mass data, and I'm only choosing the ones that were matched to the Gaia data. Uh, and the optical magnitudes are just coming from the Gaia table in the first place that we loaded in the beginning, and uh, we are taking the G Mac column. So if we run that, we're going to get the J and G magnitudes, and finally we can plot G minus J versus G. And that's going to give us the uh, HR diagram that we saw in the beginning. So then we can look at it closer and try and analyze what's going on. Uh, so in particular, this is going to be the main sequence. So those are stars like the sun that are still burning their hydrogen into helium. This is what we call the turnoff points. This is where stars are starting to die. So those are heavier stars that have just finished their lives. 
and then they go up and they become red giants just like the sun will eventually and from the position of this turnoff point you can work out the age of the cluster because that tells you the mass of the stars that are dying right now and we know how long stars of different masses live okay do we have any questions about that So in fact, Adam asked me to finish about 15 minutes before the end. Uh, and this is pretty much exactly what I managed to do. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop here. And yeah, if you guys have any questions for me or for Christian, then do let us know. Uh, and otherwise, we are going to call this a day. Well, not a day, sorry. There's going to be another workshop. We're going to call this a workshop. <laughs> and there's going to be another one in an hour. Uh, yeah, it definitely yeah. is a lot. So it is very much recommended that you click through those on your own and try changing things around as well. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. You're welcome. <laughs>